We're starting our series on uh, moral dilemmas in the IDF. And the first year here is uh, about negotiating with, uh, with terrorists. Hey, please take a... Okay. Okay, so obviously this, uh, this issue was very relevant earlier this year when Israel cut the deal with uh, Hamas to, uh, to release Gilad Shalit. And there were some people who claimed that uh, halakhically they have sources that, that show that it's forbidden uh, for the government of Israel to, uh, to release the, uh, the terrorists that, uh, that they released in order to get back Gilad Shalit. And I think it's, uh, it's worth trying to explore and uh, take a look at, at a few sources here. Um, obviously, this is not going to be, you know, if you look at the number of sources you have, it's not going to be a complete um, uh, study of the whole issue, but I think we'll get at least the idea that it's not so simple and that you can't just go ahead and claim there is a source, uh, you know, for one way or the other. Rather, it really is a complex issue that, that's up to the... Um, the, the experts in, uh, in government to really figure out what to do in, uh, in these situations. Did you want to ask something? I thought they were going to say something. Oh, no, no, I just remember um, asking somebody in Israel about that, and they said because of that one person was worth a lot. I mean, I still don't understand why they gave a thousand, but... Right. The, the yeah, amount. I mean, so, yeah, I, I heard people say that, that... Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, so it shows how much more we're worth. But honestly, that's not really mm -hmm. so true, I think, because it's more, it's more practical. Uh, the fact is that we do have thousands of uh, you know, Palestinians in our jails, mm -hmm. whereas they had at that time one prisoner, and mm -hmm. today they're we're, just... we're assuming that, there, that there's no one. So, you know what I mean? It's sort of like... I hate to say it in this way, but it's um, sort of like supply and demand. Yeah. You know, again, I hate to, to put it in those kind of terms. Like they but the fact is that they had, you know, if, we, if they had a thousand of our people, so mm -hmm. then, yeah, it would make sense. We're arguing for a thousand mm -hmm. for a thousand. But to them, it would be, I think, meaningless if we just let out one person. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I understand that, you know, it's yeah. not, it hurts me, it hurts me very much to let out even one terrorist. So these people mm -hmm. have blood on their hands, they, and, you know, if, if they have the chance, they'll, they'll do it again. But uh, just thinking in practical, I don't, you know, I don't think that that could be criticized as far as, oh, you know, that doesn't make sense as far as the price. You're doing what's practical, you know. It's not necessarily relieving space. We're regaining space, like in the, the jails. Like, let's oh yeah, that's another thing. It's costing uh, Israel tax money. <laughs> that's you know, that's another issue. You know, I heard one uh, one Israeli security um, expert speak uh, before then. He said people are looking at this wrong in the sense that they're saying, oh, you know, you can't let terrorists who have actually uh, killed uh, set them set them free because. The question of releasing them is not only a moral question, it's a, it's a practical question of how dangerous it is for Israel to release these people. Mm -hmm. So if you release a person who's, you know, crippled and uh, has al Alzheimer's and he's not, he's just incapable of, of doing anything afterwards, it could be that this person is, uh, you know, a terrible human being and, and you know, it's going to be obviously up to God to figure out exactly what kind of punishment this person deserves. Mm -hmm. But in a practical sense, it makes more sense to, to let, let go of a person like that mm -hmm. than to let go of somebody who technically did not kill, but is a brilliant mastermind and is 30 mm -hmm. years old and can have a whole lifetime of uh, going out and, and killing more and more people. Because next time he will manage or he'll continue orchestrating attacks and so on. So. You know, a lot of these things uh, become extremely emotional and people aren't making um, arguments that, that really 100% make sense all the time. 
But, uh, you know, at least what I want to show is that we do have some sources and it would be really interesting to understand uh, what does pertain and what does not pertain to, um, uh, to these kind of situations like we saw with, uh, with Gilad Chalit. Okay, so first source here, the uh, Mishnah in uh, Gitin. Ein pudin et ashvuyim yoter al kedet mehen mipnei tikun ha'olam. So, you do not ransom prisoners for more than they are worth for the sake of world, uh, well, worldly welfare. Okay, so this is, you know, the reason I brought this, there are many other sources that probably should be dealt with, but this is the primary source that I've heard people bring um, to claim that, that we cannot, here, we have it in our Mishnah, um, the prohibition. To, to make such, uh, such deals with, uh, with terrorists. You cannot pay um, what is not generally acceptable, which again, it's, it's, it seems almost ridiculous to, to discuss it in, in these terms. What do you mean? Usually kidnappers ask for $500,000. Okay, so that makes sense. So that's going to be fine. But a million dollars is not, or like, how does that work, or does it work according to what uh, the Jewish community can pay? So, you know, if they're asking for something that's not going to bankrupt the community, even if it happens uh, ten times, so that's okay. But if it's, you know, if there's a, a financial danger there, so then it's not okay. You know, it's, it's a little hard to, to, uh, to define what exactly does that mean um, uh, how much they are worth. Because obviously we're not talking about their objective worth. Uh, there is no such thing, even, uh, even when the Torah discusses uh, the concept of uh, arachin, which means, like, you know, when a person says, I'm giving, just a second, please, when I'm giving my, I'm giving my worth um, to the temple. So, you know, the, the different numbers for different ages and different people does not mean that that's what the person is worth because obviously that's, you know, way beyond any, uh, any number that you, can, that you can say. So what exactly is their worth is, is an open question. Yeah, please. Yeah, I was wondering who exactly came up with the numbers of who was getting what or was it negotiated? Um, yeah, it was heavily negotiated. Um, most of the talks, I think, were, uh, well, all the talks were, were not direct, um, but some of the talks, I think, were, uh, were secretive, um, and a lot of the process was not, was not really revealed to the media. Um, we had Egypt involved. He came back through, uh, through Egypt. The Germans were, uh, were very much invested in this. Um, so it was all, you know, indirect, uh, indirect negotiation. Mm-hmm. So I mean, and there, and the main controversy in Israel was about the uh, not so much actually about the number. Again, most practical in a practical sense, I think people can grasp this that we have one prisoner in their possession; they have thousands. So you know, thinking of percentage, they're giving us like a hundred percent of what they have, and we're mm-hmm. giving them thirty percent or less or yeah. whatever whatever it is. Um, it w- it's more about like the list of people, which a, on a practical sense, what can they, what harm can they do, and b, uh, which is no less of an issue, was a very, very emotional issue. You know, when mm-hmm. people people know that this person murdered their family members, mm-hmm. and they they see him uh, go go free. It's it just it's, yeah. it's unbearable pain. You know? What were you gonna say, Frank? I don't know if it's just like a random, like, not relevant thing, but what exactly do they mean by worldly welfare? And the reason why I ask that is because the way right. I'm reading it is that it says, like, you should not pay ransom for more than they're worth for the sake of worldly welfare, worldly uh, welfare. but okay. if you don't have worldly welfare, can you still, like, pay an excessive? Right, welfare? okay, okay, so I, I hear you. The way, the way it should be punctuated is... Um, olam, right? It's it's um, the reason. For, it's it's like a, the the reason for this law. 
the reason we have instituted this law is for the sake of worldly uh, welfare. Because if we will not keep it this way, it's going to become chaos. Like they, they see it works, you know, they ask for $10 million. So then, you know, we, we, start, uh, we start talking to, uh, to the richest Jews all over the world and, and put together the money. So obviously the next day it's going to happen again and again. And, uh, and it's impossible to, to live that way. So, you know, if, if we don't draw the line at a certain point, so, uh, so it's going to get out of hand. The, an interesting question is, why will it not get out of hand if, even if we pay $10? $10? Meaning if they see it works, so it works. You know, the, the United States has a very strict policy that they will not negotiate with terrorists. They will do anything in their power to get back POWs. They they will, they will actually you know sometimes compromise innocent lives, um, in order to you know in, in different operations to get back POWs. But they will not negotiate with terrorists because they want to show zero tolerance and it's not going to work. So the question is why is there a difference between a hundred dollars and you know hundred thousand dollars? Uh, once they see it works, they are motivated. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm leaving uh, this a bit open because uh, my main, I want to focus mainly on uh, later responsa that, that dealt with these, uh, with these kind of issues. Okay. Um, so we have here the, uh, the Dvar Yoshua, as you can see on uh, in the bottom, lived from 1905 to uh, 1976, Rabbi Yoshua uh, Ehrenberg. And uh, anybody care to read his uh, responsa, source number two? Sure. Okay. Moreover, I say that because the simple law should be that we ransom prisoners, even for more than they're worth, and the only reason we don't is for the sake of worldly welfare. We must follow the sage's uh, decision when discussing monetary ransom. But when we are talking about releasing terrorists, there is no Talmudic prohibition that prevents redeeming them, even at a ratio of a thousand to one. Okay, so please stop there. What is he claiming? He's saying this is only talking about money. Right, and therefore, but I mean, the rationale stays. And so he say, he's saying. So why why would it be any different? Saying because this is a direct prohibition and therefore applies directly to what it's talking about. Right. Okay. And I'll, only directly to what it's talking about. I, I, I think I think you're I, I think you you understand it correctly, but I just would like to define it um, in a more uh, sort of like black and white way. When we have rabbinic uh, decisions, so oftentimes we view them um, almost as as you know, technicalities. I'd say, you know, take an example from, um, from secular, uh, secular law. If somebody did something and the lawyer can, you know, figure out a reason or a, a precedent why it's okay, so the person's going to be exonerated. Even though it could be that it's proven that he did something and you know that's like, that's really wrong. But the fact is that, you know, he found certain loopholes in, in the system and he was able to manipulate them, so they're fine. So I'm not saying that you can deliberately go ahead and do that with, uh, with rabbinic decrees, but in a sense, um, a rabbinic decree is not to be studied only by uh, its rationale. And therefore you say, wait, you know, if, if the law doesn't really apply here, so let's follow the rationale. Uh, sometimes that would make sense, and that's okay. But sometimes in, in situations of, of need, so we're going to say, look, you know, the decree was regarding apples. It was not regarding oranges. So it's irrelevant, because we're, we're discussing oranges here. So he's saying, you're right, the rationale stays. This is a problem, you know, giving back. And he took the, the example of the ratio of 1,000 to 1. And this, okay... This was written uh, way before this, uh, this question was, uh, was relevant in the state of Israel. So he's saying, yes, it could, it could be that, that the same rationale applies. But the fact is that the rabbis did not rule against this. What the rabbis um, instituted was that we cannot 
negotiate with kidnappers um, for more money than makes sense. As we said, we're living that open. What does that mean? It makes sense. But for more money than it makes sense to, uh, to give them. Once we're talking about uh, prisoners or terrorists and so on, that's something else. Okay, so he's not saying, he's not saying that it's not a problem. He's not saying that, it not, that it's not going to encourage uh, terrorists to, to continue attacking us. It might do that and, that, and therefore we're going to have to figure out um, really how to deal with that. But the fact is, it's, it's very technical. The rabbi said we're not allowed to negotiate for money. Fine, we're, no, we're negotiating for terrorists. It's a different uh, ballgame. Okay, so let's continue. So I'm reading the second uh, passage in uh, source number two. See the Russia's uh, response up, where he rules that we cannot infer any ruling from rabbinic decisions. Rather, we, we must follow the decisions and not add anything to them. Thus, we return this issue to the original rule that we must redeem prisoners in any way. So, he gives further reference to the uh, Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, uh, one of the greatest uh, medieval scholars. And he straightforwardly says this, that what we can learn from rabbinic decrees is only what they ruled. Nothing, you can't, you can't say, oh, you know, this case is similar and so on. We do not do that. And because the, the basic law is that, yes, we should negotiate for every single person who is captured, so... Once we do not have a rabbinic prohibition directly targeted against this kind of negotiation, so we go ahead and negotiate. Because, you know, that, that really is the, the default position that we should be taking, is trying to do anything in our power to return that person. Um, only when we have a prohibition against that, such as giving an exaggerated uh, sum of money, then we cannot do it. Then he concludes here, Therefore, we must redeem the prisoners, even if you will say that freeing terrorists is considered to be more than their value. Okay. So, okay, I, there as in not the terrorists, right? There is the, the, the prisoner that we're trying to get back. Even if you say, wait, that's more than what he is worth, which again is not his objective worth, rather... Um, trying to foresee the future and see, you know, are they going to try even harder now to, to attack us? Um, the rabbis did not prohibit that, and therefore we can go ahead and, uh, and, and make the deal. Yeah, please. Um, do the Arabians not get a lot of prisoners? I mean, is there a reason why they couldn't have waited until they had one more prisoner, or is it every time they get one, they're ready to negotiate? Well, first of all, they know that we're going to negotiate. Mm -hmm. there, it's, but I think it's even more technical than that. Their military power is, is really nothing compared to our military power. Uh, the fact that, that we fight morally and don't just... You know, there are some countries that if one rocket were sent into their cities, and rockets are being shot all the time in southern cities in Israel, and they're getting further and further north. There are countries that if one rocket would have been shot into their cities, that's it. That would be the end of, of everything. They could care less about what the world says, about morality, innocence, doesn't matter. We're, Israel is a, is, a, is, a, is a nuclear superpower. Like We can go ahead and, and just you know, go crazy. We don't do that because I personally agree that it's, it's immoral. Um, but just the fact that we restrain ourselves and fight guerrillas um, on their terms doesn't mean that, uh, that they're up to, to the same level. The, the basic fact is that they don't have the military power to really uh, to capture mm -hmm. thousands of, uh, of prisoners the way we do. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Um, there's uh, obviously a, a lot more to, to be said about that. Um, so it sounds. I don't. I don't have. I don't have the answers. Like I don't know mm -hmm. what should be done militarily, but definitely we do have much more power. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so so that was approach number one. 
Okay, we can't uh, we can't infer from the Mishnah that discusses not negotiating with with uh, kidnappers. Okay, think of the time of the Mishnah. Think about Europe. Think about the you know most of of Jewish history. The deal was. People wanted money, so they, they knew that Jews care a lot for each other, so they'd go pick up a Jew and, uh, and get money. Hey, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good deal. And then we decided to draw the line and say, at a, certain, uh, at a certain point, we're not going to negotiate because then it's going to get totally out of hand. So first approach was, all oh, this is irrelevant because that's talking about money and this is talking about other currency. You know, it's it's almost as if, like, you know, if he said the currency were in uh, in salt, just the way uh, the Romans used to used to handle uh, currency. Oftentimes, people were paid in salt and, and other substances. Um, so, hey, you know, we're talking about money, not about salt. Fine. So here, the currency happens to be other human beings. Okay. So now, uh, for a more fundamental approach, we'll take a look here at uh, Rav Shaul Israeli who uh, died in uh, 1995. He was a tremendous scholar, a Rosh Hashiva of uh, America Zarav, and he wrote on many contemporary uh, issues that came up in Israel in his time. Um, and I think it's fascinating to see uh, what he has to say about this, uh, about this issue. Just a little background. This uh, piece of responsa was written during... Um, uh, the Entebbe uh, kidnapping, and not kidnapping, what was it called when they lost the word when they take a, a plane, hijacking. Um, <laughs> it just uh, uh, escaped me. So they had hijacked um, a plane to uh, Entebbe, and in the beginning what happened was they were uh, debating whether or not to negotiate with the terrorists and they sort of uh, gave them the feeling that they are going to negotiate with them and then meanwhile in the background uh, they sent in Israeli troops who um, who saved all the people who were uh, were hijacked and brought them back to Israel. So during that time Rav Shal Israeli was asked uh, whether or not we are allowed to negotiate with the terrorists Again, main question being, as we saw in the Mishnah, that uh, generally uh, negotiating with kidnappers would not be uh, permissible. So here he says, source number three. And okay, obviously I, I pulled out a very specific piece. It's a, it's a long piece, but he says, in conclusion, we learned that if, for instance, a person pays for a kidnapping insurance po policy with high ransom coverage, in this situation, the company has a commitment towards this individual, and they're merely acting in his name. That is, when paying the ransom. Uh, just, uh, actually, I should have brought a little piece before. He makes a very important uh, um, distinction between society paying for a person and a, and a private person laying out the money. Meaning, if a very rich person uh, can afford to pay the kidnappers, so that doesn't apply to the, uh, to the mission that we read before. We were talking about general welfare, welfare for, the, for the world. Here, it's between him and the kidnappers. If he has $50 million and the kidnappers say, you know, if he pays $50 million, we'll, we'll let you go, it's up to him. You know, he, he can make that decision. It's not the same as saying that society has to lay out $50 million, okay? So he's saying, so in the same sense, be, because we have that, that, uh, that distinction, what happens if the person doesn't have $50 million, but he pays um, an insurance company for kidnapping insurance? And, you know, I'm sure people who are worth uh, a little more than uh, our personal net uh, feel the need to, to cover them, themselves for that. Um, so he says, either that's permissible, that's not going against the prohibition in the Mishnah. You're allowed to do whatever, whatever you want if, uh, if it ends up being you personally paying forward. So you personally uh, paying forward can either be out of your own bank account, or you made an agreement with a private firm that they will pay in the event that you will be connected. Okay, so he continues, thus they may and actually must ransom him at any price, right? Because they're fulfilling their obligation. It's a company. Just as they have obligated themselves to do in return for his premiums, 
he's paying them. They they're obligated to to go and uh, and make sure he's released. And they're just doing their job, and that's fine. It's not going against the uh, the rule. In this case, there is no prohibition to redeem the person for a higher price than he is worth because it is generally permissible for an individual to ransom himself at any price. And the insurance company is paying in his name, just as I said before. Okay, so that's talking about an individual who either has money or bought some good insurance. According to this second passage, it seems that we should view the state's obligation to redeem prisoners of war is being akin to obligation of an insurance to the I should read, the obligation of an insurance company. So this is a much more fundamental claim. When you're fighting for a country, so there's an unwritten insurance policy. The government has promised you that they will do anything in their power to get you back in the event that you are captured. So that is the exact same thing in Rabbi Israeli's eyes as somebody going ahead and paying an insurance company. So by you participating in protecting any given country, it's as if you personally purchased a, an insurance policy that makes sure that whatever the price is, they're going to get you back. Those who went to war in the name of the state to protect the people of Zion have an unwritten yet obvious agreement with the government that it will do whatever it can within rational limits that do not compromise its general safety. Okay, that's an important uh, parent, uh, parenthetical comment. To redeem them in the event that they be taken as prisoners of war. So you see that these parentheses are very important. He says, okay, whatever is within rational, uh, where the words, rational limits. Okay, so bottom line is, if you ask the Rebbe Israeli personally what he thinks about these kind of agreements, he would say, you need experts to decide, is it within rational limits? We don't have the prohibition that is in the Mishnah, because this is like an insurance policy that every soldier in the IDF has uh, with the State of Israel, and the experts have to figure out what are the rational limits, what makes sense as far as the general safety. Obviously, we're not going to go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and give people, if we know that, you know, a split second later, people are going to die. The whole, the whole controversy is when it's delayed, when we're not exactly sure, are we going to be able to contain these people and make sure that they don't attack us again? Are we not? Even if they do, how efficient are they going to be and so on? You know, that's something to really take into consideration um, and, you know, could be argued that is within the, uh, the rational limits. Yes, please. I was just going <clears> to <throat> ask, wouldn't it compromise its general safety? The 1,000 prisoners? What general safety of what? Of the population of Israel? Of Israel? Yeah, depends on who they in, are. In what way? Because these people are going to, to probably attack us? Yeah. So you're right. Look, I'm sure that many of them will try. Mm -hmm. um, but they looked for the names that were the least likely to do so. So look, I, I, I don't know the details. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they published, they, published, um, not published, they publicized the, um, the list mm -hmm. of people that they were, uh, were letting go. You might say I'm naive, but I have, you know, I trust the authorities generally. I believe that the overwhelming majority of, uh, of officials who are either in government or in uh, Israeli security honestly care and are thinking straight and clearly. At least that's my hope, and <laughs> even if it's not true, so what does it help me to, to think otherwise? Uh, you know. So I do trust them, and I'm assuming that they, that they did uh, figure out um, either which people are less likely to attack, and, and even those who are uh, likely to attack, what measures can we take in order to, uh, to contain that and, you know, and make sure that, that we can stop them? So, you know, again, Israeli intelligence is uh, on the highest uh, international standard. 
So, you know, I'm hoping that if any one of these individuals even, you know, tries to, to start plotting an attack against Israel, uh, so that person will be, will be stopped immediately. Um, you know, so is it, is it a sure thing? No. Um, is it worth taking the chance? Possibly. Like, you know, I, I honestly don't have a very clear opinion on this because I don't know. I don't have enough information about how dangerous is it really. Um, how clearly are these officials really thinking, you know? Could be that for, uh, if I were higher up and had more information and more experience and more knowledge of general security and so on, so I'd be able to, to say more definitively, like, this is bad, you know, this, this, is, this does not make sense. Or, you know, this makes sense. There is a chance that no person is ever going to be harmed through this, through, you know, continuing uh, to do our hard work. Because there are continuously people who are trying to harm us, so... You know, add another thousand to the uh, to the list. You know, it, it sounds sad, but it's really it's really the way it is. So it could be that the officials are saying, "Hey, you know, we're able to day in and day out uh, contain the situation. These people are not significant in adding them. There, there are thousands of people already out there and who are every day are. trying to hurt us. Oh, I'm sorry. And at least these ones we know who they are and like can exactly somebody, like, exactly kind of we can, we can monitor them tabs, and more. tabs on them somewhat. Right. I was just wondering, like, if they had say in the names who were being picked, or if they were just given all the names. So okay, so that that was basically what took so long. Oh. Um, Israel was willing to neg negotiate uh, a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, the the negotiations were going back and forth uh, as far as the the final list. Mm -hmm. Hamas was uh, demanding a, a very specific list, and and there were certain names that Israel said under no circumstances are we going to let these people go, mm -hmm. either because they're just downright dangerous or for emotional reasons. You know, this person just did something so atrocious that we can't do it, which is a little hard to say because, what do you mean? Like, any, is there any difference between a, a person blowing up um, uh, a hotel on, uh, on the eve of Passover, which is one of the most horrific attacks in, in Israel, and the person just stabbing one person in the middle of the street, is there any difference? Definitely for the family, like, person, person died here. Person was murdered just because he's Jewish. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how they finalized the, the bottom, uh, you know, the, the final list, but either way, Hamas didn't get everything they, everything they wanted. And I've, I've heard some experts say that you know, they think Hamas got the, uh, the raw end of the deal. Could be. Again, I don't have enough information, enough experience and knowledge for that. Um, but to conclude, the most important thing I wanted to, to show is that you cannot just simply go ahead and say, oh, you know, we have this Mishnah here, so fine, so it's just prohibited. And then we can just go to, extreme, to an extreme and say, it's, it, you know, we can't even, uh, we can't even hear... Uh, any, any, anybody uh, saying that it's an option to go ahead and, uh, and negotiate to try to return a, a, a POW. Either because of uh, the Dvar Yeshua, as we saw, who says that, um, you know, technically, we're not talking about the same prohibition. The prohibition was instituted as far as negotiating uh, for money. Here we're negotiating for terrorists. And Rabbi Israeli, who more, who more fundamentally said, when fighting for a government that's different, than just a random person for the community. A person fighting for a government is as if that person paid for an insurance policy, and just as with an insurance policy, that does not fall under the rule of not, arguing, of not negotiating with, uh, with kidnappers. So too, here, with a soldier in the IDF, it would not, uh, it would not be prohibited to, uh, to negotiate with, uh, with terrorists, and he concludes with saying, okay, obviously it has to be within rational limits, and I'm adding those rational limits should be decided by people who, A, uh, are competent and, and are experts in their field, and B, you know, really honestly do care about the, the safety and security of the people of Israel, um, and, and fully understand the consequences of uh, what they are dealing with.